React India. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I know this is the last talk of the day, so this much energy is not something you would expect, but thanks. Uh, so my talk is about 3D scenes with 3JS. Uh, and let me first introduce myself. My name is Ritesh. I work as a software engineer at PSPDF Kit. Uh, so my today's talk is actually going to be about a site project I made a while ago. So the first version of it was made, I think, more than a year ago. And then I kept you know, uh, updating it after that. So there's a reason why I'm talking about it a bit late. One of the reasons is basically this. You might have seen this. Uh, so the jury's still out on whether this product will be a successful one or not. But that's one thing that we can all agree on, is that this is definitely opens a new vertical. This definitely opens us to you know, explore more, because we know that a lot more things are possible now in the AR industry, the VR industry. And this will set an example for the path ahead. So even whether it gets successful or not, the path ahead for this field definitely is very good. Um, one of the things is that as web developers, we generally, when we create 3D applications, we, we treat them as hobby projects, or you know, very specific use cases which are served by 3D applications. But now you will see that there will be a lot of apps that will start using you know, immersive view and all that because of uh, a product like this. Now Safari is soon going to start supporting this. Uh, WebXR applications uh, for uh, Vision Pro. So it's only good that we start learning about this, how to create these, these kind of applications, so that even your web app can be used in immersive view. Now, I used a term called WebXR. So what is X there? It's just, you know, there are so many realities that keep coming up, virtual, mixed, augmented, and they just, Put a variable there so you can replace it with anything. OK, so it's just a combination of all different realities together. And uh, support for web XR basically means support for all of these. Now, taking a step back, now talking about 3JS. So 3JS is a library which is built uh, on top of WebGL. So when I say built on top of WebGL, it doesn't mean that it always uses WebGL. WebGL is one of the tech it can use. It can also use 2D renderer. Now, WebGL is web graphics library that can use your GPU to actually you know, improve the performance of your application. Uh, one more thing to keep in mind is like, OK, we already have WebGL, but we don't see a lot of talk about WebGL. If you, see, if you try to find um, you know, uh, presentations or talks about WebGL, you'll find that there are very limited resources about WebGL on the web. The reason is that hardly people use WebGL directly. The reason uh, for that is that you, know, you can create primitives in WebGL, but creating anything complicated is pretty hard. Like even to create a line or you know a surface, just writing WebGL code, you have to write very complicated code for that. So what 3JS does is creates a layer on top of that and provides you simpler APIs that you can work with. Now to create any app, uh, app in 3JS, these three things are basic requirements. You can't create anything without these three things. The renderer, the scene, and the camera. Now the renderer in terms of web is basically a canvas. So it's an anti-aliased canvas that you create and pass it to the web, WebGL renderer, and a renderer is created. The second is a scene. Anything that you want to show in 3JS is created inside a scene. Uh, and the third one. The most important one is a camera. Now, when you are seeing a 2D surface from anywhere, the look remains the same. It's only the angle that changes, right? If you're watching TV, you are sitting in different angle, then the whole look remains the same. But imagine in a 3D world, like I am seeing you from here. I'll see dif something different compared to if I go at the back and then see you from, the, uh, from there, right? So the whole 
view changes when I change the angle or the position where I am standing or where my eyes are. So to implement this concept in 3D on web or anywhere, even in the 3D world, if you see games and all, uh, there's a camera that is put at a place and you always see things from behind the camera. If you want to change the angle, you have to change the position of the camera and suddenly the whole scene's view uh, changes based on where the camera is. So that's why without camera, you can't see anything. So you are always sitting behind the camera. If you keep this in mind, it becomes simple to visualize what you are seeing. So there are different kinds of cameras on uh, like 3, uh, 3JS. So I think we'll just talk about two, orthographic camera and perspective camera. Now, orthographic camera means that no matter at what distance something is, the size will remain the same. Uh, and perspective camera is basically our eyes. Like distance matters. So where you are, how, how far you are, the angle of view, all those things matter. Now, so this is how you create a simple perspective camera. This is, a, as I said, this is a prerequisite. Uh, it takes multiple uh, arguments, but I'm mostly interested in the near and far. So one thing we generally don't talk about is performance of 3D applications. Like, you know, we talk about what we have, what if we have infinite list? Then how do we show things uh, in a way that, you know, it's uh, l limited proper, limited DOM nodes are only available in the DOM, right? The windowing technique, or you might uh, have heard about virtualization uh, that we generally use to show a long list of uh, ele elements in the DOM. Now, this actually can help you achieve something similar in the 3D world. So what I'm entering there as the third and fourth argument is the near distance and the far distance. So anything that is between that, that near and far is only something that is visible. Anything beyond that range is not visible. This is kind of uh, virtualization in the 3D world. So this improves performance of the application using the camera. Now, this is how you write a basic 3JS code. So uh, you create a camera, you create a renderer, and then you add the scene and camera inside a renderer, right? But if you see, there's a loop. And you keep executing that again and again. So if you think of a canvas, at a time it shows you a single image. If you want to keep updating it, if you want to animate it, you have to re-render the new scene. OK, so that's why you keep actually updating it. This is how 3JS works. It always keeps updating the image that you see on the canvas that, that eventually looks like an animation or any movement. So now, why request animation frame? We could have also used set time interval. I think the last talk was basically about something like this. You want to render something in the next tick, right? Uh, and request animation frame also, the big reason why request animation frame is preferred is because when you change tabs, request animation frame stops. So for the performance of your application, this is better than set, uh, set interval. Now, even after doing all this, you'll see nothing because there's nothing to look at right now. So you have created a scene, but you have not added anything yet. Now, so we add something now. Uh, we add a geometry, a box geometry, and a material. And then we create a mesh out of it. So what is a mesh? Mesh, it is a combination of coordinates and a material. So without material, coordinates are nothing like, you know, you can't see anything. It's just a set of coordinates in a scene. So to make something visible, you have to add a material. Uh, there are various kinds of materials. Like if you, if, if you play games, then you might have seen that, you know, uh, if you see our skin, it's kind of a translucent material where there's subsurface scattering and all, you know, lights don't actually reflect like a hard surface. So there are different that defines how light reflects the surface, the material, and how things look when you see at a 3JS structure. Now, when you create it and then add it, uh, it gets added at 000 coordinate in the 3D scene. 
But now we also change the position of the camera because by default when we added the camera, it was also there at 0, 0, 0. So, which means that the camera was in, is now inside the cube. So you won't be able to see anything. So we change the position of the camera so that you can actually uh, see the cube via the camera. Now this is what you see. So it's, it's a top view from the z-axis of the cube that you have added in the scene. It's black, even though the material we used, it's, it's not supposed to be black, right? So we'll talk about it. But you know, everything that we have discussed so far can be written like this using React 3 Fiber. So the canvas component automatically creates a canvas with anti-alias set to true. It will always keep re-rendering the uh, canvas again and again so that things keep updating. The mesh, I said, is a, you know, a combination of box geometry and mesh standard material. So if you see this declarative way of uh, mentioning that, it's pretty simple to understand what mesh is. And this is the way you can also add cameras, lights, and all. Also, the canvas automatically adds a perspective camera. So you have to just pass the position of the camera. If you want to choose any other type of camera, then you have to specify it. In the rest of the talk, though, we won't be talking about React 3 Fiber. Because ev anything you understand, like all the arguments that you see, are exact one-on-one -on -one copy of what you pass in 3, uh, uh, 3JS. Right? So nothing new to learn here. That's the best part about it. So it provides you a 3JS instance. You can do anything that you can do with 3JS. Uh, now, I'll talk about the project. So, at the beginning of this talk, I said that I'll be talking about a project that I created a while ago. So the project was, is <laughs> called Reference. Uh, and what it is. So you might have seen these somewhere, like you know, in art stores or you know, someone who is an artist. Uh, they generally keep one of these. And this is actually used by them to get an idea of how different human poses might look. And based on that, treating that as a reference, they sketch human figures. And it's not only these, you might have seen also just hands, you know, wooden hands kept there uh, so that they can, you know, uh, sketch using these. But these are not cheap. The good ones are pretty expensive. So that's why I wanted to create something on the web which people can use to, you know, uh, as a reference and create uh, their sketches based on that. So that is why I created this project. Now, if you want to create something like this, first of all, you need a 3D model, right? And this 3D model is not a cube or a circle or a triangle, anything like that. It's a complicated 3D model. If you just start writing code for this, it won't be easy. Uh, and like, it's a combination of, I think, millions of polygons. And you won't be able to code it. Like It's not like a challenge that you won't be able to code it. You can automate it, and then you can just write generate code for this. But it's not easy. And web is not one software where you can actually create these. There are dedicated softwares for these, which 3D industries use. So when I say 3D industries, you might have heard at least about you know, some of the softwares from this list. Uh, and this is generally used for you know, movies, gaming, and all, where they uh, create these 3D structures. Uh, and then we export a compatible format. 3JS provides you various kind of loaders for different formats. We use 3JS loaders and load these scenes in the web scene that we have created. Now, there are these two popular formats that are you know, like, uh, famous in both web and th uh, 3D industries, the OBJ and GLTF format. Now, the OBJ is preferred in 3D world because it's not proprietary to any one company, so all the softwares can actually implement it. GLTF is famous in JS world because it's a JSON format. So it's easily readable. So 
that's the reason I use the GLTF format. And this is the code that was needed to load the whole model inside my scene. So if you see, first I set a decoder, because when you actually export it, it gets uh, like compressed. So you decode it. And then at the end, you just do scene.addgltf.scene, which basically means that now you have a scene which you exported from some other software, and then you imported it here. Now what this will do is it will automatically take out the cameras, you know, take out the mesh. Uh, and there are also bones and all those things that I'll talk about and then adds it to the, your scene. So when you see, this is how it will look. You know, initially we saw a cube that looked black. Uh, now we are seeing this, which is also looking same. So I think one thing that's obvious is the lack of lights. Right? So in the scene, you have added everything, but you haven't added lights. So you can't see shadows. And if you can't see shadows, or there's no, nothing to you know, reflect from the surface, then you can't see it. Uh, so that's why we need to add lights. Now, these are all the kinds of lights that 3GS provides. I think two which we might be familiar with is ambient light and spotlight. OK, so uh, I added a spotlight. This is the code for that. Uh, I'm showing the code. The idea here is not for you to understand what the code is, but just when, whenever you actually code, uh, you remember that what to look for. That's the only idea here. So you add a spotlight, you provide a position to it, you set the decay. Decay basically means that by distance, how much of the light should be decayed. And just, you just add it to the scene. So everything, if you see, you just add it to the scene in the end. You define a location, you create an instance, you define a location, and add it to the scene. Now, after this, what you will get is this. This is how it will look like. Because I placed the spotlight in front of the 3D model at some distance. And the front, now you can see there is some light. OK? But at right now, it's just a one image. There's no animation here. If you try to you know, turn it around, you won't be able to do that. It's just a canvas with a single image. Uh, and so you, you don't have any control over it, in a sense that as an end user, not as a developer. As an end user, you won't be able to do anything with this. Uh, you want different poses, right? which means that you want to move things around. So the next thing we talk about is controls. So controls is provided by 3JS. There are various kinds of controls. We'll just talk about orbital controls. Uh, so orbital controls, basically what it allows you to do is like, you know, the whole scene, you will be able to rotate it, you know, pressing, uh, like right, right clicking or doing something like that. If you are using a 3D software, it's built in there. So you can see the whole scene from any angle. Now this is how you add a control. I hope it's obvious. Like you create a control, you pass the camera because what you, when you are rotating, basically what you are doing is you are changing the location of the camera. right? So you pass the camera, and then you also have to manually update it. Not every time, just after you have added it to the scene. So after this, this is what you will be able to do. right? You see the front, there's light, but at the back, there was no light, because we added only one spotlight at the, uh, at the front of the model. So if you add another one at the back, then uh, you'll see light there too. Now, we have added a camera. We have added a light, right? And in actual scenes, there are more than like you know, uh, one cameras or one lights. So how do you debug it? Like, How do you see where something is placed in a 3D scene? I want to see where my spotlight is and uh, what it is pointed to. So you want to debug, basically, right? So there's something called helpers, a lot of helpers, basically for mesh, for skeleton, for bone, for cameras, and for everything, there are helpers. So create a new helper, pass the instance of the spotlight to it, and just add it to the scene. Similar with grid helper, like you want to see where the surface is, okay, uh, 
and then you create a grid helper and you add and this is what you will see so that's the grid helper that shows you where the surface is and then you can also see the spotlight and where it's targeted now you are able to uh, rotate the whole scene but still you won't be able to interact with the 3d model so you want to change the position of you know hands and legs and all those so that you can get the pose you want and there's a huge difference in how we treat interaction in 2d space and 3d space like in 2d space whatever is at the top you click on it and then it gets clicked whatever is behind that gets left out right if you want something like that there's a concept of hit testing where you you know figure out where the click happened and then calculate the location of every element and figure out which element you know even if it's behind some other element which element might have been clicked right but generally the topmost element gets clicked that can't work in 3d space because there are so many elements and if you want to click something you can't just assume that you want only the topmost element to be clicked right because there's a z axis so there there can be many things you might want to click so so there's a concept of you know sculpting and rigging so first we need to talk about this so this is the first step any you know like take any movie as an example maybe venom or something like that so the first step of that would have been creating this the 3d model no animation nothing just a 3d model uh and then the next step is rigging it so rigging is a step before animation now why rigging there are basically points right which can be moved you can't move a hand from between so you have to define constraints from where things can be moved and the points and the line joining those are actually bones now it seems very obvious that concept of bones for human body but bones are not always just used for human body in 3d world now bones create a special kind of constraint that you can't move one point independent of others because the distance between two points should always remain fixed and also it defines a two way hierarchy when we say two way hierarchy what do we mean imagine someone held your hand and they are pulling it towards them right first this point moves then this point moves and then if they keep pulling further then you will bend like this so this point moves right now that started from here and it will go through the whole body one after another with a constraint that distance between two points should remain fixed but even if someone starts moving this it doesn't mean that this point won't move and only you know one directional points will move even this will be affected so it kind of creates that two way hierarchy so it's not just a combination of points it's it also becomes important how you group the different points and that's where bones become very important so when we import a model generally this rigging part is already done in the 3d softwares and it's it's funny but you know there are specific job uh designations for just rigging not even animation just rigging so it's not that simple for like for human it might be but for other bodies where you want similar kind of constraints it's not that simple so now we talked about mesh there's a special kind of mesh which also includes bones and that's called skinned mesh so this model that we included was a subset of mesh which is skinned mesh because it had bones in it and then what we do is we highlight the anchor points so if you see these red spheres those are spheres we added so that it's visible those highlighted point uh, those anchor points are visible so what we do is we just you know navigate through the whole hierarchy of you know that body 3d model we find those bones we find those uh, meshes that a bone is attached to we find the anchor points and then we create a new sphere of 2.5 radius 
we we create a material out of it right and add it there and then we just add it to the bone so when you want to create a hierarchy instead of adding something directly to the scene you add it to the parent you want to control it via right now this is what you see now this is a wireframe the reason you change it to a wireframe is because if you don't change it to a wireframe those anchor points won't even be visible uh so to make sure that you know your users are able to click there they should first see those spheres so now now we start clicking like you know how how do we click on those these are 3d structures there's no straight forward on click that we get with react right so what what you do is ray casting so the ray caster api helps you here basically what it does is you click somewhere and then it tells you which all objects you have intersected with your clicking point now you can filter through it and try to find the point which you care about for example this if you see this code so the ray caster what it's doing is it gives you a list of intersects and then you filter through it find the intersect that landed on a bone anchor point and then you just you know add a transform control to it so i'll show what transform control is So this is what happens. You click on it. This is the transform control. So you can actually move things, you know, the body structure around. So now you have created one pose by moving body parts around. So the last part. Now this was enough. This gives you a reference, right, on top of which you can build things. But you can go one step ahead. you can add some post processing and convert it into a 2d image because that will be simpler to sketch right so post processing is one of those steps which you you can do to any scene like there are multiple you know post processing effects that you can see here these are built in effects that 3js provides uh, but you can also create your custom ones so what i used was sobel operator what it does is highlights the edges of a surface basically which created a 2d kind of image something like this so it highlighted the boundary of this whole structure and using this now you can export it and create something on top of this using this as a reference um if you want to see this this is where it's uh, like hosted so you can go there and see it i can also show you here it's open here so you can do this you can this is a 2d uh, like this is a 3d model now you want to show the anchor point so you show, uh, convert the material to a wireframe and then the anchor points become visible now i showed you a uh, post processing step so this is the post processing step right so i have added the post processing step to the whole scene and then you can download this image and use it as a reference for your sketch so this is it <laughs> thanks everyone uh if you have any questions i'll be around bye